everybody. Wishing you a very good evening and a very warm welcome here to Aubrey Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Ben, and I'm the, I'm the pastor here, and so glad to see so many faces out this evening. Well, we're so glad to have Robbie here um, with us to share over the weekend for the next three nights. He was already with us at the Chura last night. Just, just out of curiosity's sake, how many of you have actually heard Robbie on Faith FM before? Raise your hands up. Oh, so quite a lot of us, quite a lot of us are familiar with the voice. And uh, of course, you've probably seen the pictures on, on the Faith FM app or the website. But uh, we're so glad to have Robbie here. And Robbie, thanks for, for spending the time with us. Um, I've known Robbie for 20 years, and I was really delighted to see that he was coming to, to Aubrey when I first came here to pastor in April. He was already booked in and was so glad because next year he's already fully booked. And I was, I was hoping that maybe he might have a slot to come out again next year. Maybe you might, we might have to uh, beg a bit harder or try or pull some strings or something. Or pray that, you know, not in a bad way, but someone else cancels so that we can jump in. Uh, but um, it's, we're so glad that he's here. He's, he has been traveling nonstop for the past two and a half months. And uh, it's, it's been really taking a toll on his voice a lot, but uh, we're so glad that he's here. And even though he's uh, far away from family, all the way up there in Queensland. Um, Robbie, I just want to invite you up real quick. We're just going to ask you a couple of questions uh, before we let you get into to the, the series for this evening and for the next few days. Thank you. But Robbie, tell us your wife's name. How many children do you have? Uh, Rebecca is her name, if you're interested. And uh, we have two kids. I have an eight-year-old son and a three and a half plus something daughter. Okay. She's not quite three yet, but she's not half anymore, somewhere in there. And uh, what are some of the hobbies that you like to do apart from preaching and studying and sharing the word? What else do you get up to in your free time? What's a hobby? <laughs> <laughs> if, if, I, if I have time, I, um, I like to try a couple of things. I, I've got a, this garden thing I'm trying to make work. Um, I've got dirt there. And I've put seeds in, and I water it, but then I get, go away for like a month, and I come back, and there's just weeds. So the gardening's not going so great. But then uh, the other thing I'll, I'm trying to do is, I got my son's into drones, you know, the electric drones. So we got a drone, and we try and do some droning with cameras, and yeah, so that, that but what's a hobby again? <laughs> for those that don't know, Robbie was a programmer before, right? And he has programmed his sprinkler systems, his, the, the times to feed the cat and the dog, or the, the chokes as well, and everything. He's, and he's got a little app he was showing us the other, uh, just yesterday. You can press this button, it'll turn the water on and everything. So I guess once a programmer, always a programmer as well. Um, how long have you been preaching the Bible? Um, that's a good question. I think the first time I got asked to share my story, which is probably where it started, was around 2003, so that's what, about 20 years now? Actually, yeah, 20 years, 20 years. 20 years. And it was horrible. You're so glad you weren't there, because it was really horrible. I was so nervous, I was just, I, I thought I was speaking too long, it was turning like five minutes, and I wanted to sit down, I said, no, get back up, and it was, yeah, it was horrible. But it's, I've enjoyed it a lot more since. Hey, we, all, <laughs> we all have, haven't we? <laughs> And lastly, what are some of the interesting things on the horizon for Faith FM that you can share with us and, yeah. and let us know what's coming up? So Faith FM, it's, it's amazing what's happening with the radio station. So we, um, three years ago when I joined the team, we had 100 and I think it was 86 broadcast sites. And the goal has been, for the last three years, is to basically double that. So we've, we're up to 264 broadcast sites. And right now, we have got um, that many communities around Australia requesting, hey, we want an antenna in our community, that sort of thing, that by the end of next year, we are hoping to have 300. So that's, that's a tremendous, a lot of, that's a lot of work in case you don't know how much it takes to get an antenna up. Um, so that's one big thing that's happening, is that we're actively expanding the footprint. And then the, the second thing that's super interesting for this part of Australia is up the road to Canberra, there's a brand new studio that's just been built um, earlier this year in, the, in Canberra itself for Faith FM. And they've been recording uh, um, two shows there, just pre-recorded shows, which are going to go on air from January 1st. And then uh, Canberra is hoping, Faith FM Canberra is hoping to start a breakfast show. 
out of Canberra. So, you know, it's sort of in the vicinity of Albury, isn't it? <laughs> Canberra. <laughs> a little. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Well, before I give you the time, I just want to pray for Robbie. I want to pray for all of us that as we spend time together tonight and also uh, this weekend, that we'd also have a blessed time as well. Come, thank, let's pray. Thank you. Lord, thank you so much for bringing Robbie here. Thank you, Lord, for bringing every person here this evening as, as we listen, as we, we hear, and as we spend the time together. I just pray that you would be with Robbie, that you'd give him his words, your words, that you'd be with his voice, and that you'd sustain him. And we also pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to each and every one of us as well. Lord, please bless our time together now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, this is a really nice facility you have here at Albury. I'm first time being here, and I, I really like your facilities here. And you're quite friendly people too so far, so thank you for coming up and saying hello. So, how many of you have come out tonight for the first time? You weren't here at the dinner, in other words. Last night we had a dinner. How many came tonight and didn't come to the dinner? Just see your hands. You're not in trouble. You're not in trouble. Welcome. You're my honored special guest. And I hope everyone here from Albury who was here last night will make you feel welcome. Um, last night we had name tags. It was my cheat sheet. So I can talk to you. Tonight we don't have them. So if you come and talk to me, come and say, hey, I'm such and such and uh, I want to say something. So I get to remember some names. Um, but we had, we had a great time last night, didn't we? Or at least I had a great time. Did you have a great time last night for those who came out? I tell you what, that food was fantastic. I was told. I didn't get a chance to eat any myself, but I was told it was good. Was it good? I was hoping for a more resounding yes for that. But um, look, we had a good time last night. And last night I, I sort of gave you a, a really heavy topic. It was what the Bible teaches about um, prophecy, cashless societies, and digital currencies. And so we looked at that last night. And then tonight, what I was um, going to do, and we are going to do that tonight and tomorrow and the next night, is we're going to delve into a really crash course of what I call a masterclass in Bible prophecy. One of the questions that I get asked all the time is, how can you be so confident that Bible prophecy is worth believing? I get asked that all the time. Um, all over Australia. And so, tonight's topic is a part one of two parts, because tomorrow night's the part two to tonight, and then Sunday night will be sort of a, the, the culmination of what we're going to talk about in this little mini course. So, what we're going to talk about, we're going to hopefully give you some answers to any questions you have or someone else might have as to why we can even consider the prophecies of the Bible as worthy of our time. Isn't it just some joke of the past? Isn't it some myth, some fairy tale? So that's kind of the premise. So this is an intensive three-night masterclass section, uh, ses sessions. But what I want to remind you, I mentioned this last night to those who are at the dinner, is that starting on Wednesday night, um, Ben is going to be taking a much in-depth view of just the book of Daniel. You'll, you'll peripheral around other books of the Bible, but it's primarily the book of Daniel, and it's really an intense masterclass. How many parts again was it, Ben? 16. 16 classes on the book of Daniel. If you have never studied Daniel before, you would want to sign up for this. Absolutely free. They're going to give you all the study guides and notes. You need to register before Sunday night because they're going down to uh, Melbourne on Monday to get the resources to bring back up for Wednesday night. So if you don't sign up by Sunday night, chances are you won't be able to get the resources. But it's free. Sign up tonight. The, the sheet's out there, isn't it, Ben? Make sure you go out there, sign up for that. If you have studied Daniel before, I guarantee you, you will want to sign up for this anyway, because this is going to take you next level. I've known Ben for a number of years, and he's passionate about the prophecies of the book of Daniel. So make sure you do that. But that being said, you're here tonight to look at what I'm calling a three-part series, Cryptic Chronicles. Tonight's presentation, we're talking about how ancient mysteries reveal the future. Now, as you would have heard from last night's presentation, or if you listened to my podcast, I didn't grow up as a religious person. I didn't grow up reading the Bible. This was something that I discovered in my early 20s, and it was uh, quite an interesting journey. You heard some of that last night. So, what I want to do is I want to sort of just treat you as you have no background in any of this stuff, 
and you're sitting there going, you've got to convince me, Robbie, that this is worth my time. That's the premise we're going to start with. So let's get started. Right now in the world, there are serious things taking place. As of two weeks ago, we have a new war raging around the planet, which is the Israeli-Palestinian war. We still, you've forgotten about Ukraine, haven't you? Because it's now out of the media, because Israel's in the media. But Ukraine is still going on. This war that just sort of randomly showed up right as COVID was sort of going down, up comes Ukraine. And, you know, they've blamed everything on Ukraine from the price of the gasoline we're paying and the petrol pumps all the way to the cost of your bread. Inflation, it's all because of Ukraine and Russia and these things. That's what we're being told. But the world is living in very precarious times. There's also ongoing tensions happening in the South China Sea. I lived in Taiwan for a number of years, and while I was living there, there was a constant anxiety that China is going to come over and invade and take Taiwan and claim it back as its territory. And it's not just Taiwan. The Philippines have issues with China, um, Vietnam, and all those parts. There's tensions happening there, and the U.S. is involved in that. Wherever you turn your eyes, there is tension happening around the world, and people are asking, what does the future hold, and is it possible to know? We all know this, uh, what is it, a five-letter word, COVID. We've, uh, we've lived the COVID story, and uh, it's created a, even more uncertainty. I mean, it's getting a bit better now, but when at the height of it, people were writing into the, uh, texting into the show saying, Robbie, what does the Bible say about COVID? Is there any, any story that's going to give me some peace of how COVID's going to end? People are asking the question, what does the future hold? Then we saw, just recently, the highest increase in crime in Australia since records have been kept. There was something like a 16% increase in the period of reporting. Now, they haven't reported the period since then because it's a long delay from when they do the anal analyzing the data to when they release it. But when this came out, they, this came out in 2021, they said, what's happened to Australia? We used to be, well, you know, we get into fist fights and things, but now we're getting into killing one another with knives and guns, despite the guns are being illegal. So there's something even happening in our own backyard. Then there are people who are very worried about what's taking place with the climate. There are those who say that it's, uh, you know, the end of the world's upon us. Others are saying it's always been like this. No matter what your side of the view of climate change is, people are asking questions. What's happening with this planet? And no matter where you turn, what part of society you look at, things are uncertain. And the question is, is there any hope for the future? Is there any way to know about what will take place in the future. And then we've seen, just recently, a really fragile global economy. Now, we can look at it and go, wow, all that stuff in COVID, they're giving all those cash, um, printing the money and giving all those cash bonuses. Someone's paying for it now, and it's us paying for it on our mortgages, on our rents, on our bread, on our fuel. The question is, is it going to get worse? Is it going to get better? I've, I don't know about you, I've got a mortgage, and... Uh, the first Tuesday every month, I get a little bit uh, interested in the news. Do you too? <laughs> you know what happens on the first Tuesday of the month, right? <laughs> the Reserve Bank of Australia gets together and decides whether they're going to give me higher interest rates or lower interest rates. And I haven't seen a lower one for a very long time, have you? Of course not, because we're living in interesting times. So people are asking this question, what does the future hold? And is there any way to actually know what the future holds? Well, here's the interesting thing. In my journey over the last number of years, I have found that nearly every civilization in human history has asked the question, what does the future hold? You can go to any corner of this planet in any time period in our human history, and you'll find documented evidence of civilizations trying to figure out what their future holds. So it makes perfect sense that it's a part of the human desire to know. I want to take you back to Greece, to a place in, uh, in Greece called Delphi. Ever heard of Delphi? It's a, uh, it's a remarkable place. Now, Delphi was the, uh, the center of worship in, uh, in the old world in Greece, and there's a temple there called the Temple of Apollo. At the Temple of Apollo, there was a high priestess called the Pythra, 
And the Pithra, she would sit on a tripod stool, so a three-legged stool, and she would sit over a crack in the rocks. And at certain times of the day and the months and the years, there would be these vapors that would come up through the cracks. And when the Pithra would be sitting on this high stool over these cracks, the, the vapors would send her into a trance, and then whoever was there, she was able to tell them what their future would hold. At least that's what they believed. And so this was a very, very famous place in the world at the time, so famous that many famous people that you're familiar with in human history went to the Pithra, to the high priestess of Delphi, to find out what their future would hold. Alexander the Great visited Delphi and the Pithra and asked for a reading on his future. Nero, the Roman emperor, he went to Greece, to Pithra, to find out what his future held. Because there's an innate desire in each and every one of us to know what's the, the comfort of knowing the, our own futures, what will take place. They all want to know what does their future hold. And some of you this evening probably have that question, maybe not on the grand scale of who will win the next presidential elections in the United States, but maybe what will happen in your own future with your security of your home, with being able to pay for your children's education. You want to know, will I have a safe future? Will my children have a safe future? And so this is a question that humans have held for a very long time. Now, with the advent of the internet, the information of discovering your future seems to be getting easier and easier. For example, if you go to YouTube, there are literally millions of YouTubers claiming to be able to tell your future. They're psychics. And not just claim that they can tell your future, they can help you tell your own future. It's a phenomenal business model. In the middle here, we have um, TikTok. You've all heard of TikTok. It's a phenomenal um, a platform that's just exploding amongst a certain demographic around the world. And on TikTok, there are psychics that are happy to teach you the five signs of how to know whether you're a psychic or not. And some of these followers have more, sorry, some of these um, influencers have more followers than the entire population of Australia. More than 24 million people, some of these followers have. Because people are interested in wanting to know what does their future hold. I want to tell you from my experience, and this won't be of any surprise to you, I have found it very difficult to tell the future. Have you noticed? It's very, very difficult. I was in Taiwan um, when 2012, sorry, I, was, I left Taiwan, I was going to a Sydney, and in 2012, there was this um, great fear. Do you remember this? Do you remember the great fear that something was going to happen to the calendar? Well, the calendar ended in uh, the Myra world, and there was a great fear that perhaps they knew something we didn't know. But it turns out they didn't know anything more than we already knew. After the calendar ends, the next day starts. It's very hard to tell the future. Nothing happened. Then there was 2020, uh, sorry, 2000, year 2000. Remember this, Y2K and all that good stuff? People thought that the world might end. Maybe the computer systems would collapse. Maybe the power grid would go off. The banks would stop working. And we would come to the end of human civilization, but as you remember, nothing happened. But I took my money out just in case. I don't know if you did or not. So the point is, I'm not making fun of people who have had these beliefs, but the point is it's very, very hard to predict the future, very hard to know the future. Last night, I shared with you an interesting study done by a magazine called These Times, where they examined the accuracy of psychics, and this is what they found. For the average psychic, out of every 250 predictions, six were, um, looked like they fulfilled, which is an accuracy of 3%. So that means the average psychic, when they try and tell you the future, they will get it right about 3% of the time. Now, that might be better than you, might be better than me, but it's not very convincing that they have the gift. Does that make sense? <laughs> They then looked in the same study, okay, let's, let's forget the average psychics, let's go to the leading psychics. And what they found, the leading psychics, is that their accuracy improved, but to 16%. Now, that's pretty, pretty big improvement from 3%, but 
But just being able to tell 16% accuracy of all the people you're meeting and all their futures, it's not really convincing that you've got a great talent or a great skill. Now, in case you're wondering, is Robbie going to say that he's got the skill, that he's got the hundred? No, I haven't. I'm not even claiming to have psychic abilities at all. But I want to show you something this evening that I think is way more profoundly interesting than 16% accuracy. Can we know the future? Can humans even do that? It doesn't seem like we're able to, and if at best we fluke it. But can we know the future? From all the probability studies out there and from all the, the evidence out there, there are two things you would need if you were able to predict the future. There are two essentials, we call it. The first essential is, is that you would have to have historical accuracy. If you're going to predict what's going to happen in the future, you have to be able to know how to historically um, and accurately recount history. Does that make sense? I mean, if you're going to tell me what the price of the stock market will be tomorrow or next week, then you have to have a good record of being able to tell it from the past. Does that make sense? Like, if you don't know the past, how could you possibly tell me the future? So the first essential you need to know the future is you have to have historical accuracy. The second thing you need is a proven and dependable track record. If I told you I think that the price of, um, let's pick one, Qantas, let's say tomorrow Qantas is going to hit, I don't know, $50 a share. I think it's less than $50 a share at the moment, but let's just say it hits $50 a share. If I said, go sell your house, sell your car, mortgage your house, whatever you got to do, get the money and buy Qantas shares today because the price is going up, your first question to me would be what? What's your track record been? Have you made predictions in the past about the price of shares? And if I said yes, you'd say, well, what's your accuracy been? And if I say, ah, 50-50, <laughs> you're going to go mortgage your house? I sure hope not. So the point is, if you want to be able to have a trustworthy source for predicting the future, it has to have historical accuracy, and it has to have a proven track record. Does that make sense? These are the two things that you would need. Now, the question is, is there a source, and you know the answer is already going to be, I'm going to say there is, but is there a source that has these two essentials? And I'm going to say, absolutely there is. Absolutely. And what's we going to look at for these three nights? In this session tonight, we're looking at the answer to the first question, historical accuracy. Tomorrow night, we'll look at the proven track record. And then the third night, we're going to jump right in and put all we've learned into practice. So, absolutely, there is a source, I believe, and I'm sort of experimenting with this, that's the name of the show, The Faith Experiment, and so far, it hasn't, hasn't disappointed. So, let's look at the evidence for historical accuracy. I'm going to suggest that if we turn to archaeology as a starting point, because that's the past and that's history, when we look at archaeology, we find evidence in both history and in uh, the sciences of archaeology, we find evidence for historically accurate documents, which then we'll see tomorrow night also have proven track records of predictions. So that's what we're going to do, we're going to put these two things together. But before we can do that, when we look at archaeology, there are a few important discoveries to understand, because these provide the tools we need to evaluate these documents. So let's have a look. When we look at archaeology, I think most of you understand archaeology is the study of the past or digging up the past. We're going to look at the three most significant discoveries to help us examine the accuracy and historical accuracy of the documents we've been looking at over the next three nights. These aren't the most famous discoveries, but they're the most significant for the purposes of tonight. The first most important discovery for the uh, looking at historical accuracy of these documents we'll talk about in just a second, is the discovery of the Rosetta Stone by Napoleon in uh, 1799. He was sending his um, generals and his, his um, scientists down into Egypt, in the Delta region, and in 1799, they discovered what you've all heard of, I hope, the Rosetta Stone. You've heard of the Rosetta Stone? They found this stone, and the reason why it became so incredibly important to archaeology 
is because it did something for the science that up until 1799 was impossible to do. If you notice on the stone, I know it's not terribly bright, but if you look at the stone, there are essentially three sections on the stone, three inscriptions. The first section there we call Egyptian hieroglyphics, the second part is Egyptian demotic, it's a style of script, and the bottom is Greek. Now, this was the first time in archaeology that a stone was found that contained three different scripts on it on the same stone, and they were excited. Now, by the look of your faces, you have no idea why they were excited, because clearly you're not excited. Let me explain why they were excited. In 1799, you've all, you know what hieroglyphics are, all right? Hieroglyphics, what are they? Where do you find them? In the tombs, right? The Egyptian tombs. It's Egyptian writing. Here's the thing, though. In 1799, nobody on planet Earth knew how to read hieroglyphics. No one. Not even the Egyptians. It was a lost language. And so, if you went into any of those tombs and read any of the hieroglyphics, read any of the papyrus documents, nobody had a clue what they were talking about because nobody knew the language. But this stone created great excitement because there are three languages on one stone, which they assumed, and it turned out to be right, that it's the same message in three languages. Now, when they discovered this in 1799, everybody understood Greek. When I say everybody, the learned people understood Greek. Demotic was a known style of Egyptian script, but no one had a clue of the hieroglyphics. And so what this stone enabled them to do with the work of Genoa Franz Champollion, a Frenchman, it took him, I think it was 11 years to study and compare the Greek to the hieroglyphics, and it turned out he broke the code. And so for the first time in modern history, human beings could read and decode hieroglyphics which unlocked all of the messages in the tombs and in the manuscripts of an entire civilization outside of the known text of the, the Jewish text and the uh, Middle Eastern text. So this was phenomenal. That's the first important discovery from an archaeological perspective to look at this idea of can you know the future. That's the first one. We'll come back to that in a second. Here's the second one. The second most important discovery to help us on our journey took place in Iran. Along the, uh, the Silk Road, you heard of the Silk Road? It was a trail from pretty much over there in Iran all the way well, out to China pretty much and down into India. Along that journey, there is an a inscription up on a hill. It's called the Behistun Inscription. This is a picture of it here. And the Behistun Inscription was found um, by the British. Of course, it was there long before the British found it, but the British rediscovered it, if you will, and when they found it, it was incredible what they found. It's basically the story of Darius the Great and how he, um, it's not a great story, but how he basically finds a bunch of people that were his enemies and he ends their lives, all right? It's not a great story. But what was so amazing about the discovery of this great big inscription on along the Silk Road is, look at this, Old Persian, this is the story in Old Persian here, this is Emilite, this is the same story in this language, and over here is the story in Babylonian cuneiform. Now, remember the, remember the Rosetta Stone? Three languages, one story, right? It was able to be understood what the story was in Greek, which decoded the hieroglyphics. When this was discovered, there was a language that's up there that nobody had a clue how to read. It was cuneiform. Have you ever, anybody ever seen cuneiform? It looks like someone got a uh, flat screwdriver and they just stabbed clay a thousand million times with just a flat screwdriver. It looks just like that. And that was the language for Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization. Today, there are more than 25,000 clay tablets discovered from this era written in cuneiform. But the problem was, no one knew how to read it. 
But when this Behistun inscription was discovered, we could read the Old Persian, we could read the Amelianite, which allowed them to decode the cuneiform. It was through the work of Henry Rawson, a British soldier. He decided he wanted to break the code. It took him, I think it was 15 years of his life to finally, this is the, what cuneiform looks like. See a bunch of flat screwdrivers stubbed into clay. He deciphered it. And for the first time in human, in 1818, I think it was, for the first time in human history, we could now read, not human history, modern history, we could now read the cuneiform. This unlocked the religion, the beliefs, the teachings, the laws, the rules of all of what was known as the cradle of civilization, the Babylonian period, the Mesopotamian Delta region, all of that was now unlockable because of this discovery. Tremendous asset to archaeology. The third discovery, the third discovery took place at the Red Sea, on the edges of the Red Sea. You've heard of it, this one, haven't you? Which one is this? The Dead Sea Scrolls, very good. So, in the picture here, you can see over there is Israel, and this is the Dead Sea here. And there's an area right around the Dead Sea called um, Qumran. And in Qumran, there are a number of caves up in the mountains. Here are some of the actual caves that is all around here. You can see them. There's 14 caves in total. I don't have a picture of it. But there's 14 caves in total that they eventually found these scrolls in. But here's how the story started, if you haven't heard of this. In 1947, there was a little boy, it was actually two cousins, two Bedouin boys from a tribe there in Qumran, and they were taking care of the herds of goats that the clan owned, and they let the goats... Now, when you look at the picture here, there's not much grass, right? <laughs> but the goats thrive on this environment. And so the goats go all over the place. But when they were rounding the goats up to bring them back after the day, goats are missing. So the boys are like calling out for the goats, the goats aren't coming, and so they start getting rocks and throwing them into the caves because they think the goats have gone in there to get out of the sun and scare the goat, the goat will come back out. Well, as they're doing this along the journey up the, the, uh, the canyon there, one of the caves they throw rocks into, they hear the sound of like cracking glass, it was cracking clay, but they hear this noise, they immediately think that there's some treasure up there. So they climb up the, the cliffs, they go in there, and when they get in there, all they find are these clay, clay jars, and uh, in the crack jars that they crack was a bunch of old manuscripts. So they take these manuscripts and they go down to a, a, uh, a trader in this town of Bethlehem, and the, the clan leader, he sells a couple of these scrolls to an um, antiquities dealer in Bethlehem in 1947, and he sells it to them for a hundred US dollars, all right? hundred US dollars. Now, this, this is sort of, this is an example of one of the scrolls. So they, they sell this, and the clan's like, sweet, hundred US dollars, or 1947. It's a lot of money, right? They were then sold about five years later for 500,000 US dollars, the same scrolls. Today, they are there's no price you can pay to get these scrolls. They are considered the most in, uh, it, it, val, priceless, invaluable, whatever description you want to use. These things can't be bought. They can't be sold, can't be bought. And as a result of finding these scrolls, they went off and did more exped expeditions and they found more and more and more of these clay jars in about 15 caves spread out through the region. But the question is, why are these Dead Sea scrolls considered to be invaluable? Why are they... $100 to now, you can't even buy them. In fact, if you go to Israel, if you go to Jerusalem, right there, there's a, there's a museum, and they have one of these scrolls. It's 7.3 meters long, about that long, and it's just scrolled out, this great big, um, like, round glass building. And when you look at it, this scroll, this scroll is incredibly old, as you'll see in just a second. So the question is, why are these Dead Sea Scrolls so priceless? Well, first of all, Anything old is normally very valuable. So it turns out that when they looked at the style of the script of these manuscripts, and they did radiocarbon dating of the, some of the um, paper, because the paper is some of it was animal hide, so they were able to carbon date it, they found that the dates for the, some of these scrolls, 
dated back to 200 BC. They also found a number of coins in with the clay jars, which also uh, collaborated with the dates of about 200 BC down to 100 BC. So we're talking about scrolls that are around 2,200 years old, the oldest of them. That is incredibly rare to have something that humans wrote and it's still 2,200 years old. So that's one reason why they're very, very valuable. The second reason is, is because it turns out that these manuscripts contain prophecies about the future that fulfilled accurately. And we're gonna look at some of those on Sunday night. This is phenomenal to have a document that's two and a half or 2,200 years old, making predictions back then that we now living in 2023 can look back and see perfect accuracy. So it's obviously a very valuable document from that perspective. What's actually in these Dead Sea Scrolls is there is a collection of what we would call rules and regulations for the Essene people. The Essenes were Jewish people who um, chose to get out of Jerusalem, move up into the caves and mountains, and they basically meditated and prayed, and they copied these scripts. And a part of these scripts had their rules and their regulations. They also had some religious beliefs that these Essenes had developed, but 40% of the Dead Sea Scroll collection is what we would call today the Old Testament. So if you pick up your Bible and you, you look at the table of contents, there's two sections, there's an Old Testament and a New Testament, which basically means the part that was written before Jesus shows up and the part written after Jesus shows up. The Essenes had been copying four, well, the whole Bible, whole Old Testament, but 40% of what we found in these, this, this collection was the Bible, the Old Testament Bible or the Jewish Bible. Now, every single book of your Bible today was found in this collection except for one, and that's the book of Esther. Now, that doesn't mean Esther's not important, it just means Esther hasn't been found because they have found Dead Sea Scrolls uh, continually over the last 40 years. So they haven't found Esther yet. But every other book of the Old Testament, fragments of it have been found. Some books, its entirety. In fact, the one that I mentioned in Israel is the book of Isaiah. The longest book in the Old Testament has been found almost perfectly preserved for 2,200 years. Now that's a tremendous discovery because what it does is, it shows us that it hasn't changed, the Bible, the Old Testament at least, hasn't changed for more than 2,000 years. How do we know that? Because when they look at what it's written in Hebrew 2,200 years ago, and they compare that to the Bible that you have in your home today, they found it hasn't changed. Now, there are some, cha like some differences, but the differences are spelling of names and places. That's primarily the difference. But there is no difference in any of the messaging. Now, think about this. You imagine, how many of you uh, would consider yourselves to be pretty accurate people? All right, none of you, fair enough. One person. Well, that, that ended that illustration, didn't it? If you consider yourself to be accurate, I would ask you, how accurate do you think you'd be to sit there with a computer and to type out another document that you're reading? You're reading the document, you type it out, how accurate do you think you'd be in reading that and typing the same copy? Well, you've already told me you have no confidence in yourselves. I think I'd be pretty good at it. Maybe a couple of little glitches here and there, but I think I'd be pretty good at it, personally. It turns out that if we did that for 2,000 years, our accuracy would get less and less and less and less. But what we have discovered through archaeology is that if you compare the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Old Testament of the Bible, and the Bible you get you know, in the motel room, wherever you're staying, you see Bibles, if you compare that to that, the only difference is in the spelling of names and places. Like that, to me, is absolutely remarkable. Whether you believe the document or not is irrelevant. The fact that the document has survived with its accuracy for 2,200 years is phenomenal. So what that tells us is, is that what we're looking at today, if we want to spend time studying these manuscripts to look at prophecies and teachings and these sorts of things, we can have confidence that what we're studying today is in fact the same real deal from when it was first written. Does that make sense? So this is why one of the reasons why these scrolls are considered to be so valuable. Nothing has changed regarding the meaning. 
So, we've talked about, is there a document or is there a source that claims to tell the future, and if there is, then does it have historical accuracy and a proven track record? Well, I'm going to suggest that the Dead Sea Scrolls, primarily the, what we're talking about, the Old Testament, if you want to talk about your English Bible, the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Old Testament, I believe, in fact, I'm convinced that they tick these two boxes. I'm convinced that they have historical accuracy and they have a proven track record. Now we're going to move into seeing why do we think that they're historically accurate. Tomorrow night we'll look at how do we know they have a proven track record. Now, I don't know where you are in your journey, faith experiment, whatever you want to call it, but when I first started studying these manuscripts, the Bible, one of the assumptions that I had was, is that the Bible contradicts itself. Have you ever heard that before? The Bible makes claims and then it comes over here and it claims something else completely contradictory to itself. And as an atheist, which is what I was if you weren't there last night, I was an atheist before, till the age of 23, as an atheist, that was one of my strongest arguments against retarded Christians. Sorry, no offense. But Christians believe a book that contains glaring contradictions. And if you can't get the, the historical facts right, then why do they believe it? That's how I looked at the Bible. So in my journey of trying to answer my own questions, this is what I've discovered. When you look at the ancient manuscripts, the question you need to ask yourself is, are they historically accurate? Meaning this, do they get the dates right? Do they get the stories right? Do they get the figures in history right? Because here's the cool thing now. We have the history from other perspectives. For the longest time, the only history we had on that region of the world was the Bible. But now, through archaeology and these discoveries, we now have history from the Egyptians. We have history from the Mesopotamia region. So we now have external history to the biblical records to now test the biblical records. Does that make sense? So I was super excited because now I don't have to believe a book by faith. Now I can see if that book is accurate based on other evidences. Does that make sense? So let's have a look at a couple of them. Let's look at some archaeological evidence. The Bible talks about a place of, no, no one in the Bible as Babylon, ancient Babylon. Now, in the New Testament, there's also a reference to Babylon in the book of Revelation. That's different to this one. This, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is a description of a literal empire, a literal city with literal kings. The Bible's talked about this for nearly 2,600 years. Many people, scholars, archaeologists, and religious theologians have argued that the Bible has got the history wrong. And they've said that certain things about the story of Babylon and its kings and its places and its timelines don't add up with what we know. And this is one of the, the sticking points that I had when I started studying these manuscripts. But I want to show you what I found. So if you were to go to what the Bible describes as Babylon in the manuscripts, if you were to go there today, the physical location would be Iraq. Not a great place to visit, just telling you, be, ca be careful if you want to go there. But Iraq is where Babylon's empire was ruled from, up on the uh, river Euphrates. So if we go back to about 600 BC, so 2,600 years ago, we go to the biblical record, it claims, the Bible claims, that there was a king called Nebuchadnezzar. You've heard Nebuchadnezzar? I had never heard Nebuchadnezzar until um, 1997, I think it was, 98, when I watched a movie called The Matrix. You ever heard of The Matrix? In The Matrix, the ship in The Matrix was called Nebuchadnezzar. And when I heard that, I was like, that is a really weird name for a spaceship. And so anyway, it turns out I become a Christian about five years later, and I come across the story of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm like, no way, The Matrix stole it from the Bible. But anyway, Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible talks about this guy as a king, the great king of Babylon. And it describes in the Bible that Nebuchadnezzar makes three raids or three attacks on Jerusalem. And according to biblical chronology, just using the Bible and its seasons and descriptions and genealogies, we arrive at these three dates, 605, 597 and 583 BC. I know you're really stressed about those dates right now. I just, I can sense it. But this is what the Bible claims, all right? Now, the thing is, is that historians 
up until recently have been arguing that these raids never happened. It's impossible because the people in the story never existed. There's not a shred of evidence for these kings of Babylon in the Daniel story. But when we turn to this, um, this what we call a uh, chronicle, it's called a Babylonian chronicle, it's Nebuchadnezzar. It was discovered, I think it was in 18, don't quote me on this, 1820-something. The British Museum has it, you can go and, go and read it. But it wasn't until recently that this clay tablet was able to be decoded because of the work of um, Henry Rawson, the British soldier in, in uh, 1918. They decoded this and they found that on that chronicle, it mentions a guy called Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of, guess, Babylon, and it details that he did his second raid on, guess where? Jerusalem, in guess what year? When they work out the the differences in calendars, the year is 597 BC, exactly as the Bible was telling us for 2,600 years. So the Bible's been saying for 2,600 years, there were three raids, the second raid was this date. Historians and archaeologists are saying, well, there's no evidence, we haven't found a single thing for any of that. And it wasn't until recently, relatively speaking, that they come across this, they've had this, this um, clay chronicle in the library, in muse, not the library, in the museum in, in uh, London, for many, 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 many decades. But no one could read it until someone could decipher it, which has only happened relatively recently. And so now we have a record from the guy himself doing the second raid himself, saying this is the date that I did it. That's phenomenal, because now it caused historians to guess what? Write the history books afresh. The Bible didn't get changed, the history books got changed. Pretty remarkable stuff. Now, what's fascinating in the third raid in the Bible, so there's three raids, the third raid in the Bible says that when Nebuchadnezzar comes and he raids against uh, Jerusalem, he sends some officials. And the official that the Bible claims comes is a guy called Nebo Sasikim. Here's what it says about it in the book of Jeremiah. So this is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It says, then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and took seats in the middle gate. So it's describing that Nebuchadnezzar sent a delegate to uh, Jerusalem to basically say, I'm coming to get you, um, pay up or suffer the consequences. And the Bible says, it lists some of these chief officers. Notice this guy here, Nebo Sasikim, a chief officer, uh, an official of Babylon. Babylon. Now, For 2,600 years, people have argued, scholars, atheists, anyone who studies, they've argued, this is a load of rubbish. You know why? Because there's no evidence that these people ever existed. The, The Jewish Bible lists these people by name, not a single shred of evidence that these people ever existed. Therefore, bunch of rubbish. Until the year 2007. How long ago was that? <laughs> Not too long ago. In fact, it was, I, got, I got married on July 2, 2007, so it was 17 year, years ago, something like that. <laughs> this is Dr. Michael. He is a um, uh, linguist. He decodes things and reads languages from the University of, of Vienna. He has access to 25,000 clay tablets from Babylon. They've been discovered over the centuries. They're all there, catalogued in all those drawers behind him. His whole life is waking up in the morning, going to the office, taking out a clay tablet and translating it. That's his whole life, and he loves it. (laughs) On July 5, 2007, that particular little chronicle, you are not going to believe what he found, are you? It says on here that Nebo Sasikim was a chief official sent as a delegate by Nebuchadnezzar to Jerusalem. It took until the year 2007 to discover the evidence, but the evidence was always there. The historical record was perfectly accurate. The Dead Sea Scroll was perfectly accurate. And guess what changed? It wasn't the Bible, it was the history books. They had to get written again to say, well, actually, Nebo Sasakim is a real guy. 
And he really was sent as a delegate because now the Babylonians are telling us. The Jews have told us that for the last 2,600 years, but we didn't believe that. But the Babylonians, now we've got a witness. Remarkable accuracy. So even if you read something, you go, that's a load of rubbish. Just wait. At some point, it's going to come out. That's been my experience so far. Here's another one. Ancient Babylonians had numerous methods to predict the future. This is what we've discovered. We've discovered these things here. They're called liver omens. And what the Babylonians would do, they would take a, a sheep normally, and they would take the liver out, and they would look at the liver, and then they would compare it to a clay liver that they had made already with all these diagrams on it. And if you sacrificed the lamb and gave me the liver, I'd compare that sacrificial liver to the clay tablet liver, and if there was a bump there and I matched the bump there, then you're going to die next year. And if this one's got a, a slight line there and this one's got a slight line there, well, congratulations, you'll get married next year. Be good, good, good year for you. And they would use it as a template to dis decipher your future. That's what they had. So we found thousands and thousands of these clay livers. In the Bible, this is what it said. It said, for the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the road, at the fork of the road, two roads, to use divination, he strikes the arrows, he consults the images, and he looks at the what? At the liver. Now, nobody had a clue what that was talking about until they went and discovered thousands and thousands of these livers. What did it mean that he consulted the liver? He would go sacrifice a, a lamb or some animal, they take the liver out, and they compare it to the clay tablet, and that would determine which part of the road he should go on. Imagine traveling like that. Every time there's a fork in the road, you've got to kill something. So once again, people were asking, oh, what's the Bible on about? It's a bunch of waffle. Turns out it was exactly accurate describing what the Babylonian practice was for predicting the future. In Nebuchadnezzar's three raids on Jerusalem, which we've talked about, there is, on the third raid, we have a, a story in the Old Testament, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, about captives being taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. Have you ever heard of Daniel the prophet or Daniel in the lion's den? So that story is a part of this story. And that masterclass that um, Pastor Ben's going to be doing from Wednesday onwards is focusing on the story of Daniel, who is one of these captives. So in the story, according to the Bible, these captives are taken. Now, what's interesting is, as I mentioned, one of them is Daniel the prophet. Daniel writes a book or a scroll in the 6th century, so 2,600 years ago from now, in the past, he writes a scroll. And this scroll is phenomenal because the, you remember the Essenes who did the Dead Sea Scrolls, the copies and things? They made multiple, multiple, multiple copies of the book of Daniel, which implies that the book of Daniel had a very, very special place in the mind of the people of the time. Now, if you've ever read the New Testament, there's a part where Jesus is talking to his followers, and he says, if you want to know what's going to happen, go and study, get this, the book of Daniel. So Jesus, the rabbi, he claims that if you want to know stuff in the future, go back and read this book that's 600 years old from his day. Does that make sense? So this book of Daniel is a very, very interesting discovery. As I mentioned, the Essenes, we got 200 BC copies of these, this book of Daniel. And what's most fascinating about it is that it has a proven track record of predictions. If you were last night at the dinner, you remember the prophecy about Alexander the Great? I shared that last night. That was in this book of Daniel, one of these scrolls of the Dead Seas. So it makes predictions in their time, but it also claims to make predictions that come down to our own time, which we'll look at on Sunday night. Now, in this particular book, there's a very interesting claim that's been disputed by atheists and intellectuals for many, many um, decades. And here's the claim that Daniel makes in the fourth chapter of the story. We go to the, uh, the, the gates that enter into um, Babylon, they're called the Ishtar Gates. Today they're in Berlin, if you want to see them. They dismantled every brick 
in Babylon and they carried them across to Pergamon Museum in Berlin and they reassembled it. So if you go to Germany sometime soon, make sure you stop by the Pergamon Museum. It's about 20 euros to go in and have a look at it. Well worth it. It is phenomenal. These gates are 2,600 years old. You want to see these gates at some point. But the interesting claim is, is that the Bible states, according to Daniel, that Nebuchadnezzar built Babylon. He built the great city of Babylon. And archaeologists and historians have argued that's not true. There's no evidence for Nebuchadnezzar existing, let alone building this great city of Babylon. But it turned out that when they took all these bricks apart of the wall to transport it to Germany, and since they could now read cuneiform, they found something remarkable. On every single brick making up that wall, that gate into Babylon, it translates saying, I, Nebuchadnezzar, laid the foundation of the gates. Isn't that phenomenal? The very thing that the Bible said Nebuchadnezzar built Babylon, people have been arguing, nah, no ex evidence for him, he doesn't exist, blah, blah, blah. They go and pull apart a couple of thousand bricks from the great gate of Babylon, and every single brick is just going, na ni na ni na na I built Babylon. I think it's phenomenal. So once again, the Bible didn't get changed, the history books had to change to catch up with the discoveries. So now we know for sure that Babylon was built by a guy called Nebuchadnezzar. We also know from other tablets that Nebuchadnezzar did the three raids on Jerusalem. We also know that he sent a guy called Nebo Sarsakim. We know this stuff is now historically accurate because of other cultures and other discoveries with other languages, just confirming the same old thing that people have claimed for millennia. The Bible is sound and it's accurate. Let's move on though. When you, this, is, this is an example of the bricks, so this is actual bricks in, in the museum, so that's a brick of one of the foundations, and there's the stamp of cuneiform saying, I, Nebuchadnezzar, laid the brick. So when we look at archaeology, we find some incredible insights into the historical accuracy of the book. Despite what you read now, or what you've read in the past, revisit it, because the chances are, even as recent as 2007, discoveries have been made that validate the Bible's statements. Now, one of the ones that I find absolutely fascinating with the discoveries in archaeology is this discovery that took place in central Turkey. You see, have you ever heard of a, a nation in the Bible called the Hittites? There's a lot of ites in the Bible. There's Hittites, Canaanites, Jebusites, all sorts of ites, 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 ites. But the Hittites are an interesting group of people. Because the way the Bible describes them, they were a ferocious people, they were a, a, a warlike people, and they were a great many number people. But archaeology hasn't found any record of these people for centuries, if not millennia. And so, once again, you're getting a pattern of the story, so you know how the story is going to end. But once again, the argument was the Bible doesn't know what it's talking about, it's a bunch of made-up perspectives from one person's perspective in history. Until they did some digging in central Turkey. And they discovered, actually, not only were there people called Hittites, they had a whole civilization. And here's what they found. Well, let's talk about the Bible first. This is what the Bible says about it. They mention, the Bible mentions it 40 times about the Hittites. And um, this is an example of it. Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to attack us. Now, remember the Egyptians. Remember the discovery that helped us unlock the Egyptians? We'll come to that in a second. So the Bible talks about the, the Hittites all the time, 40 times. In fact, there was so little known about the Hittites that in 1860s edition of um, the Encyclopedia Britannica, this is what it said about the Hittites. There were eight lines that talked about what the Hittites were. And it was directly quoting the Bible because there was nothing else to talk about them. Just, there are a group of people mentioned in the Bible. That was in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Up until a recent discovery in Hattusa, in Turkey, all of this here has been unearthed now, and everything you're looking at is the city that is now believed to be the capital city of, guess who? The Hittites. In fact, the discovery is so big that if you go and tour it, they take you on a bus, because walking it is just too far, too far to walk it. It's a massive 
place. This is what they believe one of the main entrances are. It's called the Lion Gate. You can see there's a bunch of lions and stuff here. Um, this is one of the entrances into the temple. These are the priests carrying the idols in. Here's a, here's a person in, in scale to it. And then here is a procession of their priests going to the, to the uh, sacrificial room that's in the thing. Like it's a, a very, very developed civilization. Now, what's interesting is we go to Egypt now and to the temple of Ramses II, and because we can understand hieroglyphics, when we read the hieroglyphics now, guess what we found? We found a story about Ramses II fighting none other than the Hittites. Nothing to do with Israel, but they were fighting the Hittites. So, if the Egyptians are fighting the Hittites, chances are the Hittites existed. If we find an entire capital city for them, chances are they existed. Oh, which happened to mean that the Bible was accurate 40 times mentioning a civilization called the Hittites, despite the fact that no one believed it existed until um, the 1980s when these discoveries took place. So, if you go to uh, um, Istanbul in Turkey, in the museum there, you can read this papyrus document, which is the peace treaty between the Hittites and the Egyptians. So, not only did they exist from a biblical sense, but they absolutely existed from a regional sense. And today, the history books have been rewritten to say that not only did the Hittites exist, they were actually an empire. Phenomenal. The size of that empire rivaled the Egyptians and the Assyrians. Pretty good for a civilization that wasn't supposed to exist, right? Pretty remarkable. So, once again, what do we see? We see that the Bible and what it claimed was the facts, just the historical facts, we haven't looked at prophecy yet, just the historical facts, despite us uh, wiser people and the many generations past, we said, there's no evidence for that, there's no evidence for that. Well, it turns out that if you wait long enough, the evidence will be there. And all it does is it confirms the original account. So, this creates for me a really interesting dilemma as an atheist when I was doing this. Either the book, once again, like I said last night, it is a hoax and it's all been doctored and people wrote it after the fact and all that sort of stuff, or it actually is some kind of supernatural book. Tomorrow night I'm going to talk about why I believe and can show that it's a supernatural book. So, archaeology confirms the historical accuracy of the biblical manuscripts. I could go, I do another series for this, and the series is 30 presentations, you're getting a short one for three, but 30 presentations, and 10 of those presentations is just looking at the historical evidence for the accuracy of the Bible. All those contradictions you've heard of, there is very, very, very sound evidence to explain what looks like a contradiction, it's phenomenal. But if we move on and we go to one of the greatest archaeologists of the modern era, W. F. Albright, he's um, since passed away, but he was considered to be the greatest modern archaeologist. He um, was the author of over 800 works on archaeology, which if you're in that space, the one person said, wow, that's what you'd be saying too because it's a big deal to, to write that much work. That means he, he was involved in the diggings, the, the decoding and the, the translations and the discoveries and all that sort of stuff. He's, a, he's, the, he's the guy that everyone in archaeology looks to, or looked to. He was also the director of the uh, American School of Oriental Research, so he's, he's a big wig, all right? That's the point. I want you to notice what he wrote towards the end of his life and all of his lifetime of work in archaeology. This is what he wrote. He says, in the center of history stands what? The Bible. He says, thanks to modern research, we can now recognize its historicity, which means it's like it's historically accurate. He says, to sum up, we can now treat the Bible from beginning to end as, notice what he says, as an authentic document of religious history. Now, he just put his entire career on the line with that statement. What he's saying is, is that you can read anything in that book that talks about history, and it is what? It's accurate. It's historically accurate. That is a phenomenal claim from one of the leading, he was the leading um, archaeologist of our time. And so, what that tells me is that if you pick up your Bible and you turn to that Old Testament, from Genesis right through to Malachi, you read anything in there, 
and you read historical stories, historical events, historical things, according to the research, modern research in archaeology, not one thing has been discovered that counteracts it or contradicts it. Isn't that phenomenal? So we are looking at a document that ticks the first box. It's historically accurate, despite what the skeptics have said. They've all had to rewrite their books. The, bo the Bible that we hold today is a historically accurate document. But the question is, does it have a proven track record for dependable predictions? I'm going to tell you yes, but you've got to come back tomorrow night for me to show you why. And I hope that this not just helps you with your own questions, but it helps you explain some things to people who might have the questions for you. Because I know in my, when I became a, a, a follower of the book, so to speak, my atheist friends turned to me and said, you have lost all reason. You have lost all rational thought because you now believe in something that contradicts itself. But we have really interesting conversations now if that does come up again. So tomorrow we're looking at proven track record, dependable predictions, and we're going to call tomorrow night's presentation the Oracle's Code. I hope you've enjoyed tonight. I'm hand it over to Pastor Ben, and um, we'll take it from there. Thank you, Robbie. How many of you learned something new this evening? I know I did. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? that we can hold now in our phones or on the book, the Bible, and uh, we, we can hold it with a little bit more security, isn't it? It's like, oh, okay, we got a book that we can trust, really, and that's just from history. So I'm really looking forward to, our, to tomorrow night's presentation, and I hope you've been blessed this evening. Wish all of you a safe travel as you head back out uh, to go home, and uh, just on, on the way out, if you do want to sign up for the, the, the studies on Daniel that we're going to be starting in, on Wednesday night once a week, uh, do sign up just out there if you haven't already, that is. So for those that were at the meetings last night, we already had that opportunity. But uh, do come join us for two more nights with Robbie as well, tomorrow night and also on Sunday night. So it'll be beginning at 6.30 p.m. Okay, 6.30 p.m. Yes, it's 6.30, so you had it up there, 7 p.m. So, uh, <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. So, uh, thank you all for coming out. We wish all of you a blessed evening and a safe travels back home. See you tomorrow night, 6.30 p.m., okay? <laughs>